I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait a couple minutes late. That's fine. Good morning, everybody. And now, now there's too many to mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you started. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. All right. So good morning, everybody. Um, we're redoing our thermal imaging for electricians webinar because obviously a lot of people last week could not make it or missed out. Um, so this webinar is just really to talk about thermal imaging for electricians from the perspective of obviously carrying out the work um, where it's a useful technology. And because you know, it's great to see I'm, I'm seeing a lot of images like this coming up on social media and stuff as electricians are getting hold of it and they're taking images. Um, and so I kind of I kind of just wanted to kind of embrace that and, and let guys know that it's great that you, you know the toys are coming out now and that we go, we're taking them into the into the field. But I wanted to do this little webinar just to introduce you guys, if you're not familiar with thermal imaging, as to what, what the basic principles of it is and also cover some of the information about what those settings are on the camera, such as emissivity and reflective apparent temperature. Um, a bit about me, I've, I got into thermal imaging a number of years ago. Um, I was working with a company that also sold the instruments and there was a guy who'd come in regularly and trained. I found it very interesting because it kind of was a huge new field and anyone who gets into thermal imaging, once they start exploring the physics side of it, um, it's quite fascinating with with the um the way you start to look at um temperature and you look at yeah you know, i used to think of it as you know kitchen physics really because you can take this home and you can experiment with it there is a line that we need to understand and that is obviously when we have these fairly low-end cameras and i'm referring to the typical handheld ones you know like the ones like this is the Fleur c2 or ones that we may put into our into our phones we can still get a good image that will give us enough information for us to determine if something's hot or cold as long as we can understand what the behaviors should be of the target that we're taking an image of if we wanted to some um, to also then try to provide a survey service report service where we're then going to take measurements from that we may not we may need to think about what we can do with those cameras and what we can't do and that's what i'm going to explore also here is i'm going to show you the benefits of obviously a higher resolution camera where you can get much better resolution and how you can actually get much finer measurements and much more information from that obviously that is an investment though and so there is a line and um i'll also mention as we go through but i'll mention it just now there is training there's you know there's internationally recognized training levels there's um level one level two and level three you're supposed to do one before two then two before three um and they're internationally recognized for thermographers if you were wanting to carry out you know survey as a as a as a work as a work um, practice but uh, that doesn't mean, you know, you must do those for you to use the technology at work. You, know, you can add it to your tool belt, and that's great that you're doing that. It just means if you wanted to go off and carry out surveys and, you know, offer your opinions, you really have to have that knowledge to be able to interpret the information. And so we're going to go through a couple of examples of what the information is that the camera detects, how it behaves, and a couple of typical pictures that will show you some information that might be confusing. We're going to see what we can do to interpret that. Do you have any... Yep. Sorry, David. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that obviously with thermal thermography and thermal imaging, mm. um, you need the right equipment and you need the right training because it's very easy to have the wrong equipment, which isn't going to give you the right results. Um, it is. Or to have the right equipment and use it in the wrong way. Um, so although you've got the right equipment, which will actually do the job, if you've got it set wrong, uh, it's not going to give you the information you need. That's um, definitely the difference. If you're going to just take, if you're going to use the Im the imager for just observing to see where, for example, under full heating systems where it's broken, to see where cables are on the wall, that's fine. That's what we would just call qualitative analysis. You're just looking at the image and you're making decisions with the image. But if you were then going to take information from that, such as this is this temperature and this alternative is this temperature, you've really got to make sure that your settings are correct and there's no information in there that's being misrepresented. And there is, it's, there is a level of under, understanding in the way thermal images behave. They're good tools, but they can give you misinformation if you're not using them correctly. Uh, sometimes you can be well off in temperature measurements as well. We, we used to use them, I'd say, the only time I've ever used them is when I was in the fire brigade. And we're looking going back like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was very basic then. And we were looking for hot spots uh, in buildings 
Um, and, and basically, we're just looking for a difference in temperature, and almost like hmm. almost like an old green screen, and and it was like looking at very basic yeah. outlines of stuff. And so, so the, yeah, so for you guys, that was the top technology then. Yeah. Now here we are, twenty years later, and you've got some fabulous new tools on the on the market. Yeah. Um, so it's just knowing getting getting the right tool that's going to do the job you want it to do, and yeah. having the right training for it. Yeah. So I mean, I mean. Back then, the training would have been more about handling the camera, but for you guys in the fire service, it'd be more about, you know, just what we'd say, you know, qualitative analysis, where we're looking at, as you say, hotspots, trying to chase that source of the fire. Um, we're not going to take sufficiently accurate temperature measurements. It's more a case of trying to just identify it. Uh, with electricians and engineers, we may use it for that purpose, where we're trying to see if any phases are imbalanced, if any connections are of loose connection. But if we were then wanting to try to zoom in and understand the demand, to then determine if that representation is relative to the demand, we may need to then take temperature measurements from the cables. And that does require a little bit of understanding on how how to actually use the image. And this is where we go from just being able to unpackage it and use it, to then just having a little bit more of an understanding on that. Okay, so as I say, uh, it, it's really, really developing now. We've got the Fleur 1 and the Fleur 1 Pro, which is even a higher resolution than, than this C2. This C2 I carry around, um, I could get, I could probably grab a Fleur 1, I'll probably upgrade it to one of those, the Fleur 1 Pro next time. But I grab this, because when I walk around with clients and I do, um, consultants and I do systems of work and I do I look at their maintenance strategies I'll talk about thermal imaging and they'll all some of them will have a system where they'll have a company that'll come in to do their survey a lot of companies are getting companies to do surveys for fire risk management that's great but it'd be good if engineers in the factory floor had access to the technology for on the spot diagnostics and just monitoring when you have a survey it's like a snapshot you come in you take images of the current demand ideally you want good demand uh, but you can take a snapshot. Uh, if, if the guys on the f in, on the floor actually had a better understanding of what equipment is being used when, then they can actually go and they can just take some images just to get some control images. I've done some work with a couple of food manufacturers and in their control panels, when you open them up, there is actually a thermal image that's been captured as a control image of typical demand. And then they can actually look at that and they're not looking at measurements, they're just looking at the patterns. And it's very good technology and it's very accessible now. So it's a good direction. It's a very good direction. Now, with regards to the Fleur 1 and the Fleur 1 Pro, I'm mentioning Fleur because I, I was trained on Fleur cameras because I trained with the ITC, which is obviously a Fleur company. But um, I, I know Fluke cameras are very good. This is, this is a, I just have Fleur imagery. That's all I have for, available to me. Um, but, you know, do get your hands on a, a variety of cameras before you do invest, if you do choose to invest on this. The Fleur 1 Pro... And the Fleur one, you can see here, these are the ones that are readily accessible for you to just buy and plug in your phone. You can see how the Pro has a slightly enhanced resolution. When you have a slightly enhanced resolution, you can see there is just more information in your image for you to then decide against. I mean, this, this panel's a pretty good one. You can see there's lots more information with a higher resolution. Um, speaking about cameras, however, you know, five, 10 years ago, this technology was pretty much out of the reach for your typical toolbox. It was a invested technology and it would take you a long time to kind of pay off a camera. I trained on the E60, which is one in the middle here, which a number of years ago would have cost some, would have cost something like 12 or 14,000. Um, now it's actually discontinued. The first C2 which is on the left there. I think it's about three, 400. The C3 is about five, 600, but it's really quite limited with what you can do from a, um, a measurement perspective, but it's good for just the visuals. The E95 on the right there, this is the one I'm looking to get next because uh, depending on if, if, if some contracts arranged that we're looking for, we're going to get upgrade for this to, to do the work. Uh, and again, that's £10,000. But um, you think that's a lot. The, the, the good images like this, this is a high resolution image. I've got some images taken from this. There's a gentleman who does great images um, he does it full time. It's one of his jobs and he's level three trained as I say he's level one level two level three So he knows how to do the work. But this is like 30,000 pounds worth of kit So it's good, you know, you can hire this stuff though uh, But it's you know, if you're gonna start getting into it then start low and then decide how much you're going to use the technology as you go Okay, so what is demography? Uh, basically loosely translated it's science 
Uh, and that's what's great about it. If you actually delve and study it, you do, you go back to school with science and physics and understanding of molecules and heat and convection, conduction, radiation. It's quite fascinating. But what we're doing here is we're acquiring and analyzing information, okay? So the camera will detect with a special lens, typically zinc or germanium, heat that's radiated from a target and it will then detect that and it will then go through the electronics to create an image for us to see. And then we can make decisions with that image that's created from those detectors. So we've always got to understand that the image is only good if we are in control of the information we feed the camera. Okay, and we're gonna cover some basic rules for that with this webinar um, that we must oblige, uh, um, oblige to, because if we don't, we can take images on a site and then when we go home and we go to our office and we start to tune them in the software, which is very good stuff, if the images aren't captured properly, you're gonna to struggle to get good information because the image hasn't been created properly. How was this discovered? Well, uh, scientist William Herschel studied light. He put light through a prism and then it broke down to the lights that we see on a rainbow across the electromagnetic spectrum. So you go from violet through blue all the way around to red. And he took measurements, he took measurements in these different light parts and he noticed that actually when he went from one light to the next the temperatures would increase going from violet all the way along to red so he noticed that as you went through them yeah as you took a measurement from each color there was a change in temperature and then he actually put the thermometer outside of the red to take a control and he realized that the actual temperature at that point was even higher so there was another light there that we couldn't see. And this is where infrared comes from. It means beyond red. So it's a light that's actually beyond red. So it's beyond what we can see, but it is there. And that's what this technology works to actually see, it identifies the light that we can't see. And by measuring the, the temperature, it actually gives us an image of that. Um, we can see uh, some good exercise that you can even do yourself where you can, you know, you, uh, you can do in schools where you have just a little environment there with a little prism and we have the light captured there and the thermometers picking up an increase in temperature as they go from violet through to red and then beyond red. So the temperature increases as you go through to red and when you go beyond red, infrared, it goes up even further. It might be worth taking some time to study the electromagnetic spectrum. You're going to see this and come upon this in a number of different areas of study. On the EFI podcast just the other night, we were talking about radio waves, electromagnetic compatibility and things like that, which is gonna become more and more current as we look into electric vehicles and we were looking at inductive charging. So we were looking at this. So you know, do look at how the electromagnetic spectrum, which is all a form of energy and as we increase wavelength we actually decrease energy and as we have much more rapid waves we increase energy yeah and you can tell because you know whenever we talk about x-rays or gamma rays it's pretty dangerous this is a dangerous level of energy okay we, we don't worry too much about radio waves and microwaves because it's a much lower level of energy there, there are some considerations of concentration of these so this is where infrared is here so this is an amount of energy that is actually beyond visible light. But if I increase this energy, take something that is warm, but you can't see it, like an oven hob and you've just turned it on. As it increases in energy, these waves get more rapid and narrower and narrower and narrower to the point where the energy goes from the infrared, each you could see with your camera, to when it actually gets, the peak gets so much. There's an area we can study with this, which I can't cover in this webinar. We don't have enough time. But the actual wavelength narrows, 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 where it then starts to reach the energy level required in the electromagnetic spectrum, which means anything that's hot starts to appear red. It starts to appear at this end. So what happens is it's got warm here, but as it's got warmer and warmer and warmer, and the energy has got higher and higher and higher, it then tips and starts to appear in the visual range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is what infrared cameras, thermography is going to do. It's going to look for that energy that isn't so hot. We can't see it yet, but it is there. And that's what these detectors do. There are a couple of terms that you're gonna see on a camera. And these are emissivity, transmission, and reflective apparent temperature. Okay, and we're gonna cover those as we go through. We're gonna start with emissivity. Now emissivity, this is the E, 
that you'll see on the camera. It's normally set to, I think, um, 0.95. I'm just looking at the chat. There's Lee Baker. Don't forget the Mega TC3231. Yes, Mega have entered the thermal imaging market, and I'd like to have a play with that, Lee. Uh, but yes, they've entered the thermal imaging market, and they've got a good detector for electricians. Hopefully, that's that's what Lee wants me to say. Um, Emissivity starts at 0.95 typically. What this is, I'll just read it. The emissivity of an object is the ratio of the amount of radiation that is actually emitted from the surface to that emitted by a black body at the same temperature. Imagine a material that doesn't reflect energy, that doesn't transmit energy, but just absorbs energy and just emits energy. Okay, a 100% black body, okay? No true material really exists. If we take a material and we heat it up to the same temperature as that material, okay, and this is how they calibrate it. They have these, these uh, they, they create these uh, black bodies um, that they actually, you can see, if you look at how ca cameras are calibrated, they'll have a, a line of black bodies and they'll have them at different temperatures. And they'll measure that and then they'll see how close it is to one. If you take a material and heat it to the same temperature, then the black body will be a good true emitter of one. And this other material of the same temperature will give you a slightly different measurement, most likely a lower measurement, because it's not emitting as much radiation. And that value it's now giving would be proportional to a factor. So if it's giving off half as much, we've got a half factor. And we need to understand what kind of materials are good or bad emitters. Uh, this is an example of a good black body. It's got a true emissivity of one. Your cameras will come with a default of 0.95 because we can't, we can't go with one. 0.95 is the good starting point. Now, um, Lee actually did a little video on LinkedIn just recently. He said, oh, you know, you could check your cells for, emissive, uh, for temperature. And yes, the skin emissivity, we can see here, human skin, 0.98. So we're pretty good emitters of thermal radiation. There's not a lot of reflection or transmission here. So we're good emitters. And you can see this is just a typical emissivity table. If you just search emissivity tables, you'll find them all over. The, cl the clear things that you'll understand here is materials like rubber, plastic, skin, carbon, these are quite coarse materials, there's no reflective surfaces, they are good emitters. Things that are very bad emitters, that are, are things that are very, very reflective and shiny. Things like metals, copper, 0 0.02 to 0 0.74. The reason that's such a range is because you can have really, really shiny mirrored, mirrored effect copper, or you can have some copper that's a bit rusty and become a bit coarse. And if equipment, if uh, metals have impurities, any little divots, then they're going to start actually reflecting with the geometry in their actual material, which will actually become better emitters. So when you look at metals and you look at screws, screw heads or dinks or kinks in a metal, they look hotter. It's because of the geometry there, the radiation is actually being a better emitter. Okay, so that's all that is. I'll explain that as we go through. But reflective surfaces are bad emitters. So what we do as thermographers is we say, well, we won't go on those. So if I go to buzz bars, I'm not going to take measurements from buzz bars. Because if I then say to the camera, oh, I'll take measurements, but the emissivity is down to 0.05. My, my old trader, I remember him saying something and he said, low emissivity lies. And I've always remembered that because that's true. Because even though I could tell the camera, the emissivity is now 0 0.05. While the camera will try to adjust everything it sees to that emissivity, the everything else in the image is going to really put that measurement off. So we can focus the emissivity down to try to identify it. But the much better practice is to try to bring our targets up to a higher emissivity. So what I've so got in my, yeah. Can I just ask, so what, what you, effectively what you're saying is, is if we're taking a, if we're using a thermal imaging camera, what we need to be focusing on as much as possible if we want to get a, a truer, accurate reading of temperature is stuff that is, uh, has got a better, a better emissivity, like, like skin, like PVC, like rubber, like plastic, yeah. rather than going on the shiny bits like the metal. Right, so if we're in panels, we're going to look at the cable's insulating material. We're not going to look at the connection themselves. If we look at fuses, 
the the caps will be obviously very reflective, but then the actual ceramic of the cartridge fuse would be a much better emitter. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any other material of high emissivity, then what we do, and this is the this is a dangerous area because if you're working on electrics, it's likely the electrics will be energized because they need to be under load to give off the thermal patterns that we need to understand and see in our targets. So you'd want to turn it off. But what we do is we'd apply stickers or tape, black insulation tape, for example. I say black because that's habit, but actually any color would work. This is a stainless steel cup with some warm water in it. And there's a number of colors of tape here, but they've all reached the same emissivity. And you can see this is all the same temperature. This cup is all the same temperature, but the higher emissivity, in other words, the non-shiny material is a much better emitter of infrared radiation than the shiny cup, which is reflecting all of the other radiation at the same time. So my camera can't detect the temperature properly on the cup unless I put higher emissivity material on there. This is a this is um these these images I did on my thermal imaging course a number of years ago with the E60. So we have three cups here. They're all stainless steel cups. They've been added with with uh, hot room and cold water but the actual cups themselves if you look on the outside of the cups don't really show much information that shows you one against the other this is reflecting this cup on the left this has so, if, so if, if you were doing a survey then if you go into a panel yep. and you look to that so for instance a, a situation like the left hand cup mm -hmm. you look at that and you think oh my god that bit in the middle is much much hotter and the, rest. the rest of it but it isn't yeah. it's the same temperature it's just that the material that you're actually focusing on is a better emitter yeah and that's why that, it's is that right yeah because right. remember low emissivity lies these lower emissivities are giving you false readings the better emitter will give you the right reading so these spots here these spot measurements spot one 56.7 degrees spot two 24 degrees and spot three is 16 degrees that's the temperature of the surfaces not the liquids inside yeah, because obviously what's happened here is the energy inside has then been conducted into the material of the cup, which has then started to being emitted and radiated from the cup. So that's the surface temperature. It's not actually representation of the liquid, you know, the temperature of the liquid. That could be different because it all depends on conduction and then radiation. But that's the surface temperature of the material, which is what we're looking for here. So the emissivity has to be identified. And that's why we put tape on things if they're truly reflective. And this image on the right here, this is just a metal block and it's a metal aluminium block that's been heated up and half of it has been painted with a black enamel paint. Okay. Now you may think, well, according to this image, it looks like the darks, the, the, the darker side on the right is the painted side. It's actually the left hand side that's been painted. And so that shows a higher temperature because it's now a better emitter. Yeah, the right hand side is still quite shiny and reflected. There are a couple of warmer spots though on there, and that's because, as I said, it's you know, it's got a couple of kinks, a little couple of dinks on it. And those with the geometry there means that the actual infrared radiation is bouncing off and actually becoming a slightly better emitter. But this is actually not a very good emitter, it's reflecting the environment around it. The side that's been painted black is a much better emitter. Um, and companies that do this, the work on this, uh, again, ITC training, I do some work with, uh, done some work before with the Snell Group, they're good guys over in, over in the US. <clears throat> They'll show you that if you take radiators, if you take radiators and you actually have them nice and shiny in the pipework, you're not getting a lot of radiated energy from those. If you painted them, however, maybe with a nice matte, dull looking black paint, they become much better emitters of radiation. And so they become much better at heating your home. So that's the emissivity, okay? We need to understand that low emissivity lies, and whenever we're using the images, we've got to try to identify insulated materials and take measurements from those. If we have no insulated materials around us on our targets, we need to think about having a strategy to apply some tape or some other side material that we can then allow to gradually come up to a different temperature. So if you had a maintenance contract, for instance, for a, a installation, and you were going back regularly, maybe every sort of year or so to do a, a thermal image on it, um, a good strategy would be to have obviously have it all isolated and knocked off at one stage, 
and then apply some insulating tape onto various yeah. points. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got it there to focus your camera on it uh, when you go back in maybe a year's time or two years time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of questions. Um, Stuart, I'll come to you about the Flare 167 towards the end because I need to just double check the details of that camera. Uh, ben, would a different color tape take a different time to reach temperature? Um, temperature, no. Temperature, no. They kind of go all kind. They go. There, there's a, if you actually study them in a time lapse, there's a slight difference, but it's mainly down to not the temperature of the tape, but the reflection. Uh, and I'll add that onto Emma's post. If the enamel block was half painted white, what would happen? It'd still be a much better emitter. But think about the principle of if I wear a black shirt compared to if I wear a white shirt. It's a case of how it absorbs or reflects. So the white paint would still remain a better reflector for a period of time. And so there'll be a slightly lower end emissivity. And that's why we kind of go default for matte black, not shiny black, but dull matte black. And that's what insulated tape, black tape is really quite a good understanding of. And um, there's actually a, one of the specifications specifies a specific 3M tape, which is non-glossy, non-shiny, because the shinier surfaces are, or the brighter surfaces are, the more they can reflect the radiation, a bit like how clothing does in that principle. All right, so this is emissivity, okay? So on your camera, you're gonna have it set by default to 0.95. If you press that on the camera, there's gonna be a list of material samples, and those are taken from that table I just showed you. Um, you can do that. Obviously, if you delve deeper into this, you can then actually measure emissivity by having a target, and you can have a, let's say for example, I wanted to know the emissivity of this surface here for this breaker. Yeah, I could put it under load and I can then put it under a camera and I can have a contact thermometer on there. Yeah, like a K thermal couple on my multimeter. I could do that to then determine, I can then measure the surface temperature and I can look at what the camera is measuring and I can then adjust the emissivity until it matches that surface. So you can fine tune it, but that requires a couple of things. It requires you to make contact with the surface which is kind of against the purpose of, or the benefit of non-destructive testing and this being a non-contact process, but you can. And also, you know, it's a time and you need the extra equipment, but you can actually directly measure and determine the emissivity of materials. That again is what you would study if you did a level one, two and three. I could put something on later on about that, not a problem. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at the questions. Right, I'm going to push on from emissivity. There's another thing that we're going to mention very, very briefly because it doesn't really apply much to electrical. And this is transmission of infrared radiation. Some materials that you may take measurements from actually may transmit radiation through them from behind. This is due to the density of the material and actually allowing the radiation to travel through. Now, don't get this confused with a material that can conduct radiation and then emit radiation. For example, if I have a fuse board and I take an image of the panel lid with it still on and it's showing me some temperatures from the equipment inside, I've got some images of that later on. That's not the same thing as transmission because what's happened there is the material has obviously conducted some of the temperature from the inside materials and then it started to get warm, which is now emitting that radiation outside. So it makes sense when you see that, that the temperature inside it's going to be a bit warmer than the temperature you're measuring because of that loss those losses transmission however is where it just travels straight through due to the different density of the material and in electrical thermography this really i don't think it ever really is a problem so you'll find that many people that will explain how thermal images work may even remove transmission from the formula because it is many of the times not a problem the one that we do have to be aware of is this reflected apparent temperature or reflection so Radiation from the room behind you, from your environment, will all be beaming in all different directions, all scattered around. And it may then hit your target and reflect back into the lens of your imager. So you see, here's an image of a board. This board was taken. This, this camera, this, again, this is just, this is just a, a um, qualitative analysis. It's just basically a sample shot. And the reason I didn't hire a higher end camera is I was asked to do these images in the summertime, I was doing an EICR and they said, can I do thermal imaging of each board? And I said to them, why? 
why would I take that? I mean, what's the point in doing thermal imaging in the summertime when the school is off, when the school is powered down? That's going to give you no information at all. But unfortunately, some people that make these decisions, uh, you know, ahead uh, above us, don't understand that. So we just went with basic imagery. But this image on the right here, you can see the, the washer, the penny washer in the board is a lot warmer than the rest of the board. Now, a couple of things. The board has little to no information inside the board because there's little to no load. There's no differences in temperature. And you have to have differences in temperature for the actual camera to start displaying those. If you have no differences in temperature, then there's no information. The most interesting thing that my imager found in this board was the penny washer, which is reflecting me. Yeah, it's reflecting me. So when I took this image, I saw that I took it just, you know, for things like this. But then I had to then think about my angle and I had to then move myself out of the image. And you'll find that when you hold your camera up, you'll see as you move around, you'll see some of the patterns in the imager move with you. This is all reflection. Okay, and we have to handle reflection because it'll give us incorrect information. If we start reflecting the radiated infrared energy from behind us and we quantify that in our data and we say, oh, that's warm, it could be that actually, no, it's just reflecting a pipe. So we must understand the behavior of reflection in your thermal imaging. There's another example of that here. Just a control panel. These coils and these contacts run warm. Great, it looks very interesting, but you know, it's it's just this is this is a very key point for me to make right now. Anyone who does thermal imaging needs to know how to safely carry out thermography, how to safely set the camera up and use the camera and translate the information. But they must, if it's electrical, have electrical competence to work safely. Uh, like a number of companies I consult for actually have an arrangement where the thermographer will come and they'll have to be escorted by an electrician for accessing panels and things. But when they then get a report, all they get is, this is hot, check connections, this is hot, check connections. Because sometimes the thermographers don't understand the best scenarios where you have thermographers who were engineers that have taken up thermography or something like that. That's the best arrangement. So they immediately know the behavioral characteristics of their targets. So when they see the information, they go, yeah, that makes sense. Is that your arm? That's that's my arm. Yeah, that's the. Uh, can you that's... just hide? Can you can you put a pointer on it? So just show that's us. here. That's your arm, there, isn't it? Holding the camera. Yeah, that's that's my arm holding the camera. That weird looking pattern there. And that's reflected. Yeah. That's reflected. That's my radiation hitting that target, and it's coming back into the detector of my camera. Yeah. Now here, there's. An, I'm not in this. I got out of the way for this one. You can tell because it's quite, quite a good angle. But we've got a transformer, and this transformer is quite warm. That's to be expected. If we think about how hot it is, we can always just check this thing here called the span and the level. We can check this. But we can see there's some temperature here, which is reflected off of that. It's just a shiny surface there. That's just reflected temperature. So we must always make sure we identify reflected temperature. This one, another panel, got some contacts and some coils and PLCs and all stuff working and buzzing away. There's, you know, that all looks impressive. The maximum temperature in here is 33.4 degrees. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, it might have been slightly different. I did take a surface temperature measurement anyway to make sure, but I, it would take me longer than necessary. Bear in mind that I was doing this when the school was turned off. So it was basically look for any loose connections kind of scenario. And I, I did tell them that it was pretty much a pointless exercise, but the contractor that was sending me just said, just do it, makes them happy. So it was a pointless exercise. And that is why I just started to take some images that I could then use like this. This big warm thing up here is shut, reflecting off of here. That's me again. So always move yourself around in the image and see if anything moves with you, then try to get it out of the image as much as you can. You've obviously, if you, if you upgrade your cameras, you can actually get a good viewing angle, good resolution. You can even zoom in with some, okay? Auto focusing, get out of the image. If you've got persons with you inside the work area, maybe they need to step out of the area if they are being reflected as well. Try as best you can to remove those. A couple of, couple of other things about that photo, perhaps, um, for, 
to think of is that first of all you're saying it's a school it's mm -hmm. in the summer there's nobody there yeah um so obviously the information you're getting is is not uh, an indication of what the maximum loads and demands would be no. and how that would operate when it's actually uh say winter when all the kids are there uh, and the school's being used and maybe all the kitchens or whatever in use and secondly when you look at that and you think oh gosh we've got a real problem there on those couple of circuits down on the left hand side at the bottom um actually if it's like air conditioning that is just a normal expected temperature because without the actual if you didn't have a scale on there you know somebody might look at that and think oh we've got a, a real issue but you haven't mm. actually got an issue it's just equipment working normally so yeah. you've got to look at the scale and then have a look and see perhaps what loads are on and what they're actually supplying mm -hmm. and this is one of the benefits that you get with um with the use of pallets where you can actually adjust um isotherms which we'll see later on where you can actually set an isotherm to actually change the color on your image at a temperature so if you were going into this panel if i looked at this panel i said oh every conductor in here has a current carrying capacity of 70 degrees thermoplastic i could set an isotherm to 70 degrees and if anything goes over that it then comes up as a fixed red color like an alarm on my imager yeah i could do it later i could take the image now and then i can go to software and i can set the isotherm in the software later the information is in the image as long as i get the image correctly collected and collected correctly um but the point is if the equipment's not on there's little point um the standards the uh, the, re the recommendation is to have at least 40 percent demand this is a recommendation that comes across uh across from the us on this um so you know if i was to go i'm, I'm going to do some very soon to an infrastructure that right now is pretty much dead because you know because of what we've got going on but we're gonna to have to turn on demand we're gonna to have to represent at least 40 percent demand i was when i did some of this for a food manufacturer a couple of years ago when i looked at creating a system of work i said okay so i've got one factory that makes christmas cake uh, christmas puddings i've got one factory that does pizzas one factory that does poultry one that does red meat so they're all busy at different times of the calendar year so i contacted every single factory manager or their chief engineer and i said okay when are you busiest and they said, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're busy here. So, well, that's actually when I want to be there. And when I explained why, they didn't question it. They didn't say anything about it. They said, oh, yeah, that's, that, thanks. That's, we've never been told that before. That makes perfect sense. So we try to find a way that I can come around and get them the best information when they needed it, which is when they're under quite a large degree of demand. Because bear in mind, a lot of this work is carried out for a fire risk assessment. And if it's carried out for a fire risk assessment, we need to identify when the system is under the biggest amount of stress in use so if you have the right understanding on how this technology behaves and what you're trying to do get that across to your client then you have to come up with a workable solution and again for all the all the companies i've worked with there's always been a solution we've always managed to work something out this image this was taken in dubai um walked around out so you go outside you know you go basically you know if you've ever been over there you go out of a building with air conditioning and then you hit a wall of heat and you kind of like desperately look for the next air conditioned building so i'd sometimes walk around in between in between training things that we were doing over there and i just i just observed things outside i'd observe the ambient temperature the metal bollards would reach i'd observe the ambient temperature on cabling cabling outside i mean we think of cables now in the UK, we'll say cables have a current carrying capacity of X amount, but that assumes that it goes from a standard operating temperature of maybe 20 degrees up to 70. But in Dubai, if they're already exposed to the sun, the solar loading has increased the ambient temperature of those cables upwards of 50 degrees. I think the DY regulations, I think it's 45 degrees is the ambient over there. I don't know if you remember that. You're, you're muted, Pop. Was that right? Yeah, the ambient temperature that we take in Dubai was 45 degrees. Right. Uh, so they start so there. That's your starting point. Yeah. So I looked at some cables that were under direct sunlight and they were at 55, 60 degrees without being switched on. So you've got to then consider, well, how much space is left, you know, for that cable? Is the cable selected correctly? So I took that out. But in this image, we're still talking about reflection. And you can see there's a pattern on this image here. There's this, this defined line in this here this is actually a reflection of a build which you can just about make out there there's a building here which is giving off radiation which is being reflected due to the angle of my image 
So when you are out and about, do move around with the imager. Don't just stand still, then take an image. Get the imager up and move about. See what you can see move with you. That's picking up reflection. Things that reflect, you want to either remove or we need to find a way to measure, which we're going to show in a minute as one of the standard methods. So to conclude with these three things, our camera is going to collect information which is emitted from our target, potentially transmitted through the target, which is not as likely with electrical, but it's also very much reflected from the target. That's all going to go into the camera. We need to identify how much of that information is emitted from the target, and then we can say how much of it is reflected. So that camera then, if it knows how much is emitted, it can then take the amount it's got and then make a deduction to then give us a better representation of temperature. If we don't tell the camera how much information is actually being reflected or transmitted, it'll just give us the whole lot of information as a temperature, which won't be a true representation of that target. With regards to this reflection, what we do is we identify the target we're going to measure, and in the position we want to stand to take the measurement, we get a bit of foil, rumpled up foil. Um, I, I used to have it on a bit of cardboard from a beer box. And this creates a diffuser. And we place that in line of view with our target. So basically, where, if I stand in front of a panel, I maybe would put this on the lid of the panel before I open it with a bit of blue tack. And I stand back and I take an image of that. And that is reflecting to me, scattering all of the information from all of the other emitted radiation, emitted thermal information from behind me, from beside me, from above me, from below me. And I'm now capturing an a sample of that in my imager. The basic rule is to set the emissivity to one and a distance of zero meters. Okay, we're gonna go for a fairly large box or whatever the detector can manage. This will give us a value of temperature, which is not from our target. It's from everything else. Okay, and we can then allow that to be a measure of reflective apparent temperature, which we can then enter into the camera. And then when we then set the camera for the next measurement, having told it what the reflected temperature is, it will allow for that deduction from the measurements that we then get. So is that like nulling your continuity tester? It's pretty much the same theory, yeah. We are deducting any other unnecessary information that may be reflected from our target. But again, we wouldn't want to put this in the corner of the room over there if my target is over there because i need to make sure that it's picking up all of the potential information that's coming from behind me beside me above me including myself yeah i've got to try to get all that information from the target and then bear in mind with live electrical we don't want to put this in a live panel then yeah. take that down take the lid off and then hopefully that same information should then be going to your target yeah. yeah, because everything, everything surrounding you, behind you, everything's reflected from behind and surrounding you is not going to change. You know, the fact that you've taken the lid off is everything else is going to be the same. Uh, uh, so, you, so you deduct that from, and you set your camera to deduct that, just like exactly. nulling, nulling a tester. Yeah. yeah. So, in some locations like boiler rooms, there's lots of shiny surfaces, lots of reflection, and lots of temperatures. So, it can be a bit of a, a fun exercise. Now this is a this is a little boiler uh, boiler room or um, yeah this is a school boiler room, and we've got here a couple of pictures that I've overlaid just to kind of show a better representation. Again, this these these images were taken with a fairly low end camera, and you do have to when you have low end you do have to do a lot of work with what you get. Higher end cameras uh, they're a joy to work with. Okay, so we've got this cylinder system, we've got this heating system, but here we can see that this pipe work here. There's, there's a temperature there, but then this pipe downward here, yeah, is actually, this pipe here is cooler than the, the, uh, the taps or the connectors. Why is that? Why do we think that is? Why does this appear to the image to be a cooler temperature than the connections when you can clearly see it's all the same piece here. It's all the same pipe work. The reason well, it, being... Huh? It's got to it's got to be at the same temperature, isn't it? Because it's all yeah. it's all metal pipe work. So I'd imagine it's because it's shiny, right? Shiny, is it so shiny copper. You see, this copper here is quite shiny, quite reflective, while this here is a bit more coarse, less shiny, much more of an emitter. So, so that get comes more... back to your emissiv emissivity, yeah. Yeah, this uh, this is a better emissivity surface. It's the same uh, copper, brass. You know, again, remember they had they had a variety of emissivities. 
the ones that are more reflective are the ones that are more shiny yeah or have a mirror surface and whilst the ones that are much more duller duller is that a word um they are much better emitters and so yes these are all the same temperatures but to the image it does look like there's some increase in temperature here it's just down to emissivity remember low emissivity lies yep ben Di differing metals different emissivities different emissivities different um surfaces okay thinking about this then we've got here these fuse caps you can see here we've got a temperature there's obviously some level of load on this third fuse here but you can see these caps here and this connection looks a lot cooler than this part and this again is emissivity there's a emissivity difference here so the camera doesn't get as much information from those this is absolutely fine we don't have to try to make all these emissivities match all we need to do is identify the different emissivities understand what we're seeing and then take the information from the better targets so the cable insulating material the cartridges or things like this higher emissivities okay so i mentioned earlier on about some um some basic rules that you need to do to make sure you get a good image initially so the first one is focus some cameras will have autofocus some cameras like the 60 that i use had a manual focus it's actually one of the reasons why i liked it although it can trip you up but having the manual focus just allowed me just to play with the image a bit i was really quite enjoying just tuning the image but if you get your image out of focus what happens is all of the pixels it just merges and so you can see on this image this is quite a low-end flare but this big circle here is your target now when you when you spend more money that gets smaller to the point where it could just be a crosshair for one pixel it's all about points of measurement okay bigger the camera the more money you spend the more points of measurement that you will get the better the accuracy but if it's got poor focus this is smudged it's blurred and so it actually it's hard to pick up a particular measurement um, and as you can see with the result we actually have quite a significant difference for that material for that target another one is span and you can see this is 21 to 20 uh, 38 span here now the span is the part within the temperature range we currently use now you may find sometimes you've got the camera and you actually have something that's very very warm in your image and so it's very very cold so the camera then tries to adjust the span to accommodate both the high and the low end um this is i mean it, when you look at cameras you'll notice i mean look at resolution that's that's the key the better the resolution the better the image the better the work you can do but do make sure that your range of the camera's ability is within your requirement i mean because if you're going to work on kilns or something that's very very warm you may need to go for a higher range imager but if I have something that's very, very high and very, very low in the same image, I either need to try to adjust my position to get just the one I want and not both. A good example of this is sky. Sky obviously is, you know, it's very, very cold. And so when you have the sky in your image, sometimes the, the span just goes like that. And all that detailed information just goes away because you've now accommodated a very low end of your span. If you try to get rid of that, and you then allow the information just to be in a much narrower field of temperature differences, then the actual image will give you a much better representation of those differences. If you have a very large span, then there's so much information that the actual area of detail you're looking for, there's not much definition. We're gonna see an example of that very soon. With this target, try to fill the target, okay? And one of the solutions to this is to get closer. We've gotta be very careful with electrical thermography then if it's obviously going to be on a panel that's been removed and it's energized we've got to be very careful but we want to try to fill that target because this this is giving me a measurement of this of this space you know an, an average so it's obviously taking into account the part that's not my target for my measurement so i want to try to get closer try to fill that measurement point as much as i can with my target so i get the right information okay now, this is going down the line of quantitative analysis. I don't really need to know that for qualitative. Qualitative is just looking at the hot and cold, what's hot, what's cold, and taking information from the visual image. Quantitative is where I then want to actually get data from the image. That's the key difference there. 
This shows you a, an example of the different resolutions, okay? All taken at a distance, a couple, a couple of meters distance with the same 24 degree lens, same field of view. But you can see the 160 by 120, there's a bit of graininess there. 320 by 240, it's a bit smoother and we've got a bit more of a range in that. You can see there's a bit of a lower end. And then 640 by 480, there's more information, it's much smoother. It all depends on the image you want to end up with really um, my recommendation if you're going to do thermal imaging and you're going to quantify the information you're going to do a quantitative analysis take measurements you're going to want a better resolution than the typical handheld so i would say like the 60 i used which is a 320 by 240 resolution um, unless the software's got some enhancement you're going to need something like that to then start taking pixel by pixel measurement information. But everything else below that is fine for hot, cold imagery, you know, qualitative, that's absolutely fine. It's important to have a little play with them just to see what information you can get. Here, we're taking an image of this corner here. We're looking, obviously, this is obviously from building thermography. Now, we've got a four and a half meter distance and you can see the door frame has got into the image that's a cooler spot. So the span has increased to accommodate 15 degrees. So my span has increased. And because my span has now increased, I've lost the ability to have more accurate information in this space where I'm actually wanting to take my image. So if I go closer from four and a half to two meters, I get rid of that doorway. The span, the bottom comes up to 18 and I start to get more information in my image. So I get closer. Okay, try to fill your image with just that information. Try not to accommodate a lot colder or a lot warmer information if it's not your target, because it's just gonna give you less resources to play with when you want to tune your image. With electrical, however, we've got to understand that there is a bit of a danger with the thing we're gonna get closer to. So that's a problem. So don't go right up to it and take off the electrician thinking cap about danger and think about your system of work. Don't step over that boundary. Um, again, um, you can get cameras with telephoto lenses, you can get cameras with better zoom. So if you want to stay a good distance, you can still get up from a distance and um, indoors with building thermography and electrical, that's fine. Outdoors, you've got to think about winds and different temperatures, but it's pretty, the technology is there. It's a bit more of a price point, however. A couple of images that show this. Here's an image that was taken of a three phase load center. And this is a, again, 80 by 60. There's only 4,800 measurement pixels in this. Very, very few. And so this appears like one big smudge. And because you have fewer pixels, you want to try and get more information. You want to tune this image. The only thing you have when you have something as low end as these is the, the idea of going closer. So you're going to go closer and you start to then, you know, you notice that as I get closer, this information starts to then become more understandable. Now, I can now see that I've got the blue phase and I've got a conductor here with load. No, doesn't mean there's a problem. This is peaking at 22.8. So I'm not looking at any problem other than, oh, that circuit's on. And that's again, that's why it's important for electricians or people who understand electrical systems to actually look at these. I see, I see some very good imagery by a lot of thermographers and sometimes they'll take images they'll take pictures of a three phase and one phase will be warmer than the other two and they'll immediately pull a problem with that phase but they won't give you the load information i've seen when they have given you the load information it says that that phase is under a larger load but they don't sometimes join the dots so you do need to have that competence as well here that's an extremely relevant point though david isn't it because of course it is i've seen i've seen thermal imaging surveys where they don't actually give you the span they just show you a photograph and it might be similar to that where you oh you've got this red image which is oh you've got a real problem here and you haven't actually because it's actually only at, well it's not even 23 degrees yeah so without the span and without the full information about the circuit and what you're looking at um you can use that information mm. to cause all sorts of issues where there isn't one you know you give the it wrong was, information you give the wrong sort of 
uh, result to the people that you're actually supposed to be doing the job for. I actually found it very frustrating because there's a couple of co companies that are nationwide and they had the contracts for these large manufacturers because they can cover the nation. And I'd, and I'd be there as an electrical consultant and I'd be looking at their competence roles, their training matrix, and I'll be doing a bit of duty holder work. And I'll, I'll say, have you got thermal done? They go, yeah, yeah, that's done. Or some will go, oh, yeah, thermal. I'll go, well, what's up? And they'll hand me a report with page a page a page with low resolution images, all one, all one color, or all the information they get is check connection, check connection, check connection. There's nothing written about electrical demand, about utilization, about ambient temperatures, about cable current capacities. There's nothing in there at all. Um, and so a lot of people have lost the respect for what the potential is with this technology. Because a lot of people are just taking images and going, that looks hot, check it out later on. And they're just, they're just capturing things that are warm without actually knowing the information of their target. They just know the information in their camera. Um, and again, I can't emphasize it enough. Competent electricians coming into this field, picking up a camera and then going on a bigger thermal imaging training journey to develop a much better understanding of thermal. That's going to be a wonderful thing if we can get more of that. Definitely. Um, so in this case, I go one step closer just to kind of see here the information there. And actually, yeah, it comes down. Get, get a bit closer, change my angle, remove any reflection. I actually end up with about 24 degrees. I change my angle to get in there to actually check the cable connection. Uh, but yeah, look, the, and bear in mind, I mean, the cable, the, there's, no incre there's no decrease in temperature. If you have a temperature here and then it decreases as you leave, that suggests a connection issue. If the temperature is consistent along the journey, that's just its load. Um, but these illustrations just show I had to get a lot closer. Let's look at the real image. I've got a lot closer. I'm about, uh, about a meter away from that panel now. That's absolutely fine as long as I've got sufficient PPE, sufficient protection, and it's in the system of work. What you don't want to do is do this work and step, you know, have a boundary and then step over your boundary. Another thing we need to think about, going back to these rules of essential things to capture images, is your angle. Now remember, we're looking at the emitted energy from a target and trying to capture it in our lens. So if we have an acute angle, there's not gonna be as much information going into that lens. So if we stand right in front of the target, that's great, all the information's going straight into the lens, but we're in that image as well. So straight in front isn't good, but going to an angle greater than 45 degrees, you start to lose information. So you've got to find that sweet spot. Go in front and then go sideways a little bit and see if you can see any reflection still and then start to adjust. But you may get to a point where you've adjusted so much because you're reflecting the other dipstick next to you. Tell them to move or tell them to come this way. Get reflection out of the image as much as you can, but do not sacrifice it for angle. Angle will start to give you a emissivity, an accuracy, and then you're just losing information. That's illustrated here, back in Dubai. We've got outside floor space. You can see here, we've got one type of floor material there and another going in this line here. And another, and a, yeah, we've got this line. And you can see how that actually shows you temperature differences. Now these different temperatures are actually just different emissivities. The floor's the same temperature, but it looks like there's a different temperature because this material, this brickwork has a different emissivity to this one. Okay, so if you were to actually measure the temperatures, they would be the same. But as you look at the image, you can see that it actually starts to fade off and get cooler. Over here, I mean, there's no shading. This is shading, this area here where this shadow is, this is shading. But we lose emissivity this way because the angle of the emitted energy is nowhere near hitting our target. The angle is now so narrow. So don't narrow the angle. We mentioned standing straight in front of the target. Bad idea. Okay. This is obviously glass. Uh, light, visible light can travel through glass, but thermal imaging, th uh, th 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 um, thermal radiation, infrared radiation cannot. So if you point it at a glass or a very reflective surface, as we've discussed, you're just going to see yourself. So move yourself and anyone else. Always look at that. Look at your image and move around and see. Stand still. See if anything else is moving in your image. If any information is moving in your image, something is moving that is reflecting in, around you. 
for, for all intents and purposes, you can try to remove everybody, but if you're in a factory, it might be that you have to account for some of it. You could even, um, we did this once in a factory up in, um, up in um, Earlham, near, near Oldham. We put up some screens. I uh, don't know what they were. I don't know where they came from. I just said, I wish I could screen. And about 20 minutes later, these screens came up. So they just screened us off. Yeah, it didn't cocoon us or anything. It was just screening off so that those people behind us who are just working weren't in the information of our target. And we've mentioned emissivity. Let's cover it again as a main rule here. We must make sure that our measurement is taken from materials of high emissivity. This is a water boiler. Um, this was, uh, I think this was in Dubai as well. Again, a few measurement pixels here, but we can still get information from this label. There's a little clear label here, which is obviously not as shiny, not as reflective, has come under the temperature load of the whole appliance. It's the same temperature, so it's a much better emitter of the radiation. Okay, so take your measurement from targets of high emissivity. We mentioned solar loading earlier on. If you are outside, okay, this is, I mean, in building thermography, solar loading is a big thing. In building thermography, if I'm gonna go outside and measure insulation or things like that, I need to do that either first thing in the morning or towards the end of the day where the sun's loading on the building hasn't actually made an impact. And there are great images. Um, there's the Institute of non uh, BINDT. They've got some great articles on this, but you can see how if I have sun on a building and maybe there are balconies that give off a shadow, you can see these shadows creating weird patterns on your targets. Now that's easy to understand, but it means that you've got information you've then got to try to work around. And information that is, information you have to work around with just confuses the issue. So building thermography, we would do right in the morning or towards the end of the day where the solar loading isn't as consequential. But electrical, our main concern is, like I said earlier on, if the cabling is exposed to sun for a period of time, we can, with no load, take a measurement, see what the cable's reached. That's going to change its ambient temperature. That's going to change its current carrying capacity. I did that here, but I wasn't too concerned with the ending temperatures that I got because the load here is just fairy lights around a, a palm tree kind of thing. But if this was a, it was when we were over in Dubai, there were events going on like golf tournaments and things, and they were outside. And we started to say, okay, well, do you have temporary distribution? And is that kept in the shade? And we started to look at that. And um, we, uh, that, uh, we, that never actually carried off because I think uh, we, I don't think the event went ahead, but events that were run outside, we had to look at the, uh, we had to think about, we ended up getting on, involved with it. The idea of shading being installed deliberately on systems if they're exposed to the sun. Um, in the UK, the same thing. Uh, we were at an event last year or the year before, uh, and there was a distribution box, and it was really red hot. The sun, you know, summertime, and it was not under no load. And I questioned it then, and I just wish I had my camera on me just to kind of get that information because it was very hot to the touch. You know, um, I think when you when you look at that image there, I believe that's during the daytime. Yeah. I don't even think those lights were on at the time. These you, lights you, weren't. No, no. You can see the, the temperature there of the equipment anyway, just because of the, the solar loading. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a big issue. Uh, obviously, if the, you know, it, I mean it was Dubai, and it, I mean we talked about a forty-five degree ambient temperature. Um, but you see there that it's actually parts of those equipment are actually much higher than that. You've got up to about 56 um, degrees there. So, yeah, different types of material, different sort of emissivity, and, and they absorb the heat in different ways, don't they? Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I had this issue when we were on a, a job a couple of years ago, and there was a long marquee, and we we're over on the heath part, and the distro and the 63 amp plug, it was really hot to the touch. It was feeding the kitchen, you know, dishwasher, I think it was or something. And you kind of think what loading, you know, the current carrying capacity of that. And I, I just wish I had the camera so I could actually have uh, taken the measurement and then added an adjustment to see that. That's probably the next step of what I need to do with um, some of our 7909 stuff is bring some of this technology into it for events if they're running for a period of time. Mentioning load requirements, um, okay, so 
Worst case, yeah, or peak load seems to be considered at least 40%. This is from an FPA 70B. Heat generated by loose connection rises as the square of the load, the higher the load, the easier it is to find the problems. Yes, um, <laughs> higher loads, loose connections, problems become a much more evident. Um, lower loads might not result as into such a high temperature. Um, but you've got to have a load. Okay. There's also things like cooling effects of wind or other air movement as well. So if you're going to do outdoor thermography for you know substations and things, you'll end up looking at telephoto lens, quite a good uh, angle, and you're going to have to think about things like wind effect and other cooling factors. But you've got to have a load, and you've got to understand the characteristics of your load. If you see a cable, if you see some breakers like this, I mean, let's ignore how bad that looks. If you see that, and you go, whoa, 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 that's hot. It's actually it's just on. That's all it is. Okay, and remember... That could be a six amp breaker. That could be a 63 amp breaker. There's no difference because the conductors should reach the same temperature under load because of their sizing. They're sizing for different capacities. So we, we wouldn't expect lighting circuits to look cooler because they're wired in cables that are designed to carry less current. They should run to the same typical temperature. So, you know, if you see a light circuit and you go, oh, that's hotter than, you know, that's the same temperature as, as a cooker circuit, there must be a problem. No, you know, it's most likely absolutely fine. Look for trends. I mean, you can see this, this low resolution image. You can see you've got the, the MSX overlay with the actual image. You can see there's a little bit of a misalignment. And that does happen um, because of the, diff the distance between the two lenses. You've got the real lens and the thermal lens. Uh, it's not perfect. It's more there for you to just easily see your image. When, um, if I was to do a survey, I would take a real image and then I'd take an MSX image and then with the software, you can just click it over. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about software in this webinar. I just don't have the time, but it's a great tool. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I just want to throw at you, which are both to do with infrared thermometers uh -huh. rather than thermal imaging cameras. Uh, talking about infrared thermometers, there's one from Neil saying, "Would the emissivity, the difference in the material emissivity, skew the measurement of an IR thermometer?" And I would, I would imagine it would, wouldn't it? In principle, I think it would be the exact same. I mean, I I haven't actually studied that uh, about the thermometer behavior, but I think it's the same principle. What we do, they work the same way. Um, yeah. Obviously, what the camera does, obviously, is it collects the information and creates an image from the information. But in principle, it should be the same. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you took a, a a reading with an infrared thermometer and you had it aimed at the screw or the metal parts of the MCB, mm. for instance, uh, it might give you a different reading if you had it aimed at the plastic parts. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you, I tell you, what, I, I believe it would be, but I would test that. I mean, if you've got an infrared thermometer, you know the theory here. If you've got a material that heats up to a temperature and then there's a reflective surface on there and a painted surface, or maybe put a bit of, I'd say what, if you've got like a shiny Please, kettle, yeah. let's say you've got a kettle that's shiny, put some insulation tape on the kettle, some non-glossy shiny tape, turn the kettle on, allow that to heat up and then see if there's a difference in temperature and let us know. I'm actually probably going to try that later if I can find I'm, I'm sort of, Yeah, I'll <laughs> take a guess. It probably would make some difference, but uh, I could be wrong. But, uh, yeah, I, th yeah, I think it would. I mean, in principle, it, it's all about emission of energy yeah. and if the red detector is yeah. measuring that it should do yeah. emma's also asked because um also to do with infrared thermometers yeah. we were talking earlier about taking a like a, a control reading mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. using a thermometer on the mcb or whatever mm -hmm. uh, she, could we use an infrared thermometer to do that control reading and again we, we could couldn't we yes we could um uh, again if if the if the uh, infrared thermometer is um, if, if you're looking at the surface, I mean, we, we, we talked about the idea of measuring the contact temperature. So we had a precise understanding on the temperature surface. Um, now, an infrared thermometer, you want to maybe measure the contact to see if the infrared thermometer is picking up the same measurement. And then if that is, that's the same way as the thermal imaging camera. If, you were, if they were, for example, both working on the principles of emissivity like we just discussed, then an infrared thermometer would work the same way as a thermal imaging camera. Um, I honestly haven't looked into that to decide to actually understand if that would work that way. I will look in and um, and discuss that next time we talk about this subject, I think, because no. that's interesting. Um, trying to think, I don't have an infrared thermometer in the house, I think. No. <laughs> but uh, I've got um, I've got a multimeter with a K type thermal couple on that, so I could just put it on that and I can measure the temperature under load when it reaches a point. 
I can then obviously then just measure it there and see if it's the same. You could all do that. I'm pretty sure if you have the if you have the uh, measuring tools. Uh, was there any other questions on th infrared there? Or I no, there were, um, there's one from Lewis asking about what temperature on a circuit would you begin to ask questions about? And I think it all depends on, this is one of those things about how much load is on there. Is it yeah. a expected it's... load? <clears throat> is it within the design of the actual um, components of the circuit, the wiring, the insulation and everything else? Some circuits are designed to work fairly warm. When they're under full load, yeah. Uh, I think quite often with this, it'd be a comparison thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, and this is where we get a big problem because a lot of companies will. I mean, there are companies that will do. I was asked to do some some work, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to do it in a certain way that a lot of companies won't. And it's very much the same problem we have with EICRs in that sense, and that there are companies that will just take a picture. They'll take a panel down, take a picture, put the panel back, take it down, take the picture, put it back. And they don't collect information such as the loads, the characteristics, the duration, the demand. Um, and so all they're doing is a snapshot, but there's not enough information there. If I take a picture and I see some conductors of varying temperatures, I don't know if those are good representations of overloads because I don't know the information such as the design currents. If I, if I took a bit of extra time, I could find that information and I can then say, right, well, that's actually only carrying X amount of amps, but actually it's pulling more because you can get, again, uh, Fleur, Fleur partner up, uh, Fleur have another company, I think it's um, X-Tech or something. They connect to the cameras, uh, Fluke do the same. So you can little put a little clamp meter around and the actual value is put into the image that you collect. So when you print out the image, it's there overlaid. You don't have to do that. You can just get your typical mega clamp meter, put that around the conductors, you take your image, and then just provide the information. But if you can measure the amps and you can then put that with that, that's fine. The difference here is measuring the amps is obviously the point where you're then going to start clamping around cables under load. And this obviously bridges a gap right now that currently exists where thermographers don't get too involved with that. Some, some thermographers will be electricians and they'll go in and they'll do the proper work. Some will just be assisted by an electrician. I'll take the panel down for them. Thank you very much. And then they'll move on. And then they'll just come back with reports of, oh, that looks hot, that looks hot. But there's a lot of information that could be put in the middle there, which a good engineer and a good electrician would want to do yeah. to provide a huge, inter a better interpretation of the images. It's, it's also, I think you've got to think about the electrical principles of what you're, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. In as much as if you've got a, a conductor, I mean, you've got an image there where the conductor temperature, okay, it seems a little bit higher, you know, right at the terminal, but pretty much the conductor temperature is maintained all the way down the conductor. Mm -hmm. That would point to the fact that the circuit is under a load. Yeah? yeah. So you've got the same amount of current running all the way down the conductor and the same temperature all the way down the conductor. Yeah. Because if you have, if you have a loose connection and it's arcing, beginning to arc, Mm -hmm. then you would have a hot point at the connection and then the temperature of the cable would reduce as it went away it would. from the we'll, connection. We'll, and we'll see an example of that soon, but that's right. So obviously where you have connections, there will be some slight temperature variations, um, but the peak here is 31 degrees. There's no problem here. Um, it's when you have a really increased temperature and then you start to see a thermal gradient traveling down the cable away that you know that there is a real problem with a hot spot on that connection. Okay. Um, so we've got to have load on, and it's the same with things like underfloor. This is one of the common applications. I know a lot of electricians are now buying cameras for this as, as the main reason at first. They're installing underfloor heating systems, and they want to just check it. That's absolutely perfect, um, absolutely perfect. And this is, again, this is just what we would call a qualitative analysis. There's no reason you cannot use a simple low-end one like this or the Fleur One Pro, whatever, for this purpose. Yeah. Uh, there's a lady on Instagram, Louise, she had a great example that she used where she had a flow one into a tablet and she had a two sockets on the wall and she was looking for a way to get the cable between them to find a point on the floor to access. But the cable went from the socket on the right outwards to the left, but the socket on the left, it went downwards. So the cables didn't look like they went in the right zones. There was a point where the cables were supposed to meet. So she plugged in a heater for 10 minutes and allowed the cable to just pick up a little bit of temperature. And then with her Fleur One Pro plugged into a tablet, she could actually see the cable to the socket on the right. It came out to the left, but then it went downward out of the zone direction. But she could see that. 
and she could actually you know just run a bit and that's a great example again how this technology is really good for electricians and you don't have to then take measurements it's just visual support it's just visual stimulus to give you a better understanding of what's going on no load no information no point simple as simple as that okay this panel again another one at a school take a thermal image of a load of a panel with nothing on there's no information there is no point to it yeah here same thing no load no information no point the most interesting thing in this image is actually this cooler place here which if you look at the real image is just a shiny surface it's a reflection of the environment you ever gone into an electrical cupboard yeah it's a warm stale environment okay and so the environment you've just come from which might be air conditioned is a much cooler environment so the area behind you might appear to be a lot cooler in some images or if you're in a plant room it might be a lot warmer in other places so there's no information here there is little to no point in doing that okay so again this is low end 80 by 60 resolution 4800 measurement pixels let's step it up and you remember the camera we said right at the beginning, the, the, the very high-end camera. What you can understand with this technology is the benefit of high resolution if you wanted to see a lot. Now, we've got here two cables. We've got here two live conductors. There's another live conductor. And then there's obviously one going off here, which might be a neutral. And we can see here we've got some level of heating. And this is a phenomenon that we all know about. We always try to remember. Yeah. They are uh, circulating the, the eddy currents, the induced current here. It's there. You can see it. It is there. But look at the span. I mean, we're looking at a temperature of 19 degrees here, 18 degrees. We're looking at a temperature here, of 16. So it's only a few degree change. Yeah. So it's not. It's not like ah, that's that's dangerous. Going to catch fire. That's not what we're looking at here. What we are looking at though is that the phenomena can be seen with good resolution thermal imagery okay palettes um some areas of thermography will stick with a specific palette like security you'll see the police will be using the black with the white so the guys pick up as a little white thing running across a field they may sometimes flip that with white with the black um for electricians and engineers we kind of have free license to use whatever palette we think best illustrates the problem for the client and helps us tune it so there are a number of palettes that we can choose i'm sticking with some images from this camera because i do love this camera you know this is this is this is you know i wish i could afford this thing um and you can see how this is the iron camera this is the one that you'll often see with thermal imagery but you can see how this this lovely camera here has got nice close resolution we've got a box here and in this box we've got a high point there's a line tool been put in where we can see this line tool. This is this is all done afterwards. This is all done with software afterwards. This little line tool shows you that we've got box one, and in box one we've got line one, a maximum temperature of 60 degrees there, and here we've got 54. So there's quite a significant loss in temperature there, increase here. Okay. Now you could then catch another box. If these were under the same load, this does look like it's under a slightly higher amount of load though. We can then capture this and compare the different connections, but it clearly seems to be some connection issue here for there to be such a significant change. Okay. Just a, just a quickie on that one. Could it yeah. be unbalanced phases? Unbalanced phases could be a reason for this to have a temperature, but when yeah. we've got, when we've got a connection here and you can see a, thermal gradient in just the connection itself yeah. we allow we'll accommodate some level of degree of change but the question here ah. is this this is this is six degrees of change six degrees of change in the connection yeah. from there so, to there so again the important thing is to look at the span isn't it because i've, I've just looked at that it's just got my eyes in focus and of course it's going up to six nearly 61 degrees at the top there yeah it's a huge span so you're looking at uh, 30 odd degrees from the from the bottom to the top. Yeah. So yeah, so it's important to look at the span because there's quite a few degrees difference yeah. in that in that top half of the span, isn't there? There is. There's a lot. There's a lot of difference here, and that's what this. That's why he's, he's used the line tool here to illustrate that there is a six degree change in this little connection here. And the question is, you know, if that's not happening here, then there's potentially some defect occurring or some problem here. 
Um, same image, but a different palette. Okay, different palette, rainbow high contrast. Now you might choose this because this, this is warmer than these two, but here it's actually a lot more obvious. So you may choose this palette for the contrast. Yeah, again, it gives you free license to decide. Now I mentioned earlier on isotherms. Okay, so isotherms are good if you want to have an alarm. Um, that's what's happening here. So we've got an isotherm that's been set just to a point. Okay, so we've got maximum temperature 60 degrees in there, but he set an isotherm to actually highlight a specific temperature. Okay, but what if what if you want to have an alarm and a, uh, an alarm and a pre-alarm? All right, <laughs> just seeing your message. <laughs> So let's say that, okay, I want a warning on the image if I'm going to be within 10 degrees of the peak. So I've got a 60 degree maximum cable current carrying capacity and I don't want it to go over 50 or maybe I've got 70, I don't want it to go over 60. Then that's what the yellow can be for. But then when I go over that, that could be the red. So you can have these, this is, this is all done in software. As long as you follow the rules of focus, angle, the emissivity, distance, and you get the image correct, you can then go back and put it in the software. And this is where it really becomes an art. When you take the science of understanding how to capture the image, your knowledge of the details of the information you're collecting, you can then go back and with the software, you can tune it. You can then tune the images, add the data you've collected, and you can then give the client huge value. Uh, and that's exactly what this guy does. You know, really good stuff. Um, so this okay. is, yeah. So I've just got to say, we've, we've actually got people doing uh, experiments as we're doing this, which is brilliant. <laughs> um, Stuart's been boiling a kettle, uh, a glass kettle, um, and doing sort of measurements on it um, with insulation tape and stuff like that. Um, uh, and Emma's been doing a, a test with an infrared thermometer uh, on the toasty maker, uh, and it does skew. The, the Does records. it skew a bit? Oh, that's yeah. cool to know. Yeah. Thank you for letting us know. So, yeah, we, we, got, we got active experimentation going on as, as we do the <laughs> webinar, which is brilliant. That's Thank perfect. So well done, guys. Brilliant. Right. So these are great palettes. Um, now let's talk about this uh, qualitative, quantitative scenario. So a qualitative survey is where we're just using the image for information. So this is obviously a, a you know solar farm, a solar array. And in a solar array, we want all of our cells to be nice and healthy. Because if we have any single cell in a panel down, it, ru it ruins the whole string. Any guys who are in solar will know if you lose that. And obviously drone thermal imaging is very strong in this field these days. It's quick, it's effective, and it gives you that view. Um, but it's just qualitative analysis at that point. You can then go deeper quantitative if you need to but you don't really need to go that far in this field you can see that we've got a couple of panels there one's got a dead cell one's got a, a, a lot of resistive heating and a string of cells here and these need a bit of investigation because it could be that these are having a huge consequence to your actual generation so great use for qualitative surveying this is a fairly good end camera but you could also do quality of surveying with a low end camera. Here we have three conductors through a contactor, and you can see that this third one here is under a significant amount of stress. It could be loose connection, it could be overload, it could be imbalancing. This is where this would be a, this would be a catalyst to then carry out further investigative work. You can then get a camera and take a much more deeper image of that, or if you're an electrician or engineer, you might just go, I'll have a look at that and you'll probably get your, your clamp meter out and you'll measure the current on there or something. But you can use, you know, you can use the low end images for qualitative surveys as much as you want. I did have a training one day and I was playing with this camera. You can tell it's this camera because of this huge circle spot in the center of it. But I just pointed at the wall and I went, oh, and I caught this image of the wall and nothing to do with electrical, but clearly there's some insulation missing or something in this wall. So, you know, this is all qualitative. It's just using the imager to see things. And then at that point, you'll then decide if you need to look further. Got two lights here. You might upgrade your lamps to a higher wattage. You might change the wattage or LED, which might have a higher, higher heat output. It might start heating an adjacent building uh, material more than it used to. Uh, that looks like it could be a potential danger, but really it's... Um, you know, bear in mind that 27 is here, this temperature, again, your software, you can just click here, click here, 
and it will then tell you the measurements. The software is really fun. It's really, really fun. And you can decide if that's a problem or not. And it's not really, I should imagine. Yeah, but that's the point of qualitative. I mentioned a consumer unit earlier on. Here's a board here, got a series of RCBOs, quite warm RCBOs with the coils inside. So what's happening is they are emitting infrared radiation outward and that temperature is then making contact with the plastic and that's conducting that energy to the point where that's reaching a temperature and that is now being emitted. And that's what I'm measuring there. So it's a bit warmer inside than here. So if I, if I take an image here of the board and I go, oh, it's only 25 degrees, it's warmer inside because that's obviously conduction and then emission. So you'd determine if you wanted to investigate further from that point. But don't think of it as a weakness, it's just an operational characteristic, because that's just our CBO. So we can see these couple of little circles here. That's your neutral bar. We know in the past couple of editions of BS7671 that, that we've had to upgrade our boards to metal, and the neutral bars was one of the king culprits. And we can see here, how that neutral bar does create some level of temperature under load. So going from qualitative to quantitative. So this is where I, I'm going back to this wonderful, I, I can look at these images all day with this camera, but this is where we want to collect information. So what we've got in this image is we've got a, let's call it a three phase thing. You've got three phases there. And you can see we've got here, one conductor, we've got another one hiding back there, and we've got this one. But what we've taken here is a box and a box, and this gives us a comparison. Now, if these boxes are under the same amount of load, then it would be fair to say we can compare. Only take comparisons if they're under the same load. Why would you compare conductors under different loads? You wouldn't. So as long as you know they're under similar loads, you can then take comparisons with your imager. So we've got box one and box two, box one and box two, maximum 55 and 56, half degree difference not too bad yeah the hot points are marked there as well and then we've got this little line profile line one here hottest point coolest point line two here hottest point coolest point and these with these tools you can actually just you can just drag them wherever you want them and you can add as many as you choose to so in this little tool here this line one we've got 49 to 46 so that's again three degrees of change at that point yeah and we've got here line two from hot to cool. We've got 50.7 to four. There's two degrees of change. So you've got to consider there. You can see there's actually two cables here. There's actually two. You've got to consider if that is warranting further information or not. Now, for me, I'd look at how much of a temperature I have here, and I'd follow this all the way along to the point where it becomes consistent. And if it becomes consistent, then I'm okay as long as it's not such a fall if the fall is great it does suggest a poor connection real poor connections though will just shout at you they'll just shout at you because they'll be you know upwards of 100 degrees or so for very dangerous connections or sometimes i mentioned earlier on when things get when infrared or the energy gets so hard high the actual you think about the electromagnetic spectrum these might start to creep into the visual spectrum so if you arrive at a site and you can see it glowing hot you don't need your infrared, infrared infrared camera anymore. It's now come into an intense level of temperature that you're seeing it. It's now reached the visual spectrum. And that does happen now and then. Or you see I the think, after effects of that happening. Yeah. I think another thing to consider, which I've just thought about, and you probably thought about ages ago, um, was you talked about earlier about RCDs and, and coils. If you're mm -hmm. connected to a standard MCB or if you're connected to a standard fuse, which is, you know, then you would expect... Really? Okay. Are we finished? Lee. No, I'm saying okay. goodbye to Lee. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, when we talk about this difference of temperature from the connection going back down the cable, with some pieces of equipment like an RCD, which has got a coil in it, the actual RCD will actually have heat. It will it'll warm up. Yeah. yeah. So you will have a little bit of heat dissipation going away from the contact. There will be. There yeah. will be a there'll be a much larger collection yeah. of heat in the device because it's the device. There's control, there's technology there. Yeah. So you so you need to understand the electrical aspects of things uh, as well when you're looking at this thermography. You need to you know put yeah. all the all the skills together. It's, it's the skill of using the thermography, <laughs> understanding the actual equipment, understanding the unit you're using, and understanding how electrical kit acts and works at the same time. Mm -hmm. This is the E60. This is the one that I studied with, and you can see it's seven 
76,800 measurement pixels. So that's a lot more than the basic few thousand you get from this. Not as much as that wonderful high-end camera, but it's adequate. So I've got here three conductors and I've got here some spots on them. So this one's under more load here, spot one to spot two, 33 to 34. There's one degree of change there. This one here, spot five to spot six, 25.8, it climbs in temperature to 28.8 there. This one here, spot three to spot four, 23.7 to 27. So there's an increase in temperature there. And what this actually, what the cause of this was the bending radius. The, the bending radius going through the panel was actually over tightened, obviously, which created a resistive component. So the bending radius, which we always say in electrical um, courses, you know, don't overdo your bending radius because you're going to affect this, the mechanical integrity of the conductor, misshaping it, and you might create a high resistance point. With the thermal imaging camera, you can start to actually see this stuff that we've been showing about. So, um, yeah, quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis. Um, there's a huge huge wealth of information in thermal imaging it's a really interesting field now in the electrical industry we've got a little bit of a mention of that we've got Guy and Snow Stream. Guy and Snow Stream recognizes thermal imaging it says it can be valuable to assist electrical inspectors okay especially in the early identification of any possible overheating faults um, it's not a requirement it's not a requirement to use it it's a great additional tool and if you do use it remember with eicrs or any inspection work you need to work to the model forms but you can work from them so you can integrate thermal imaging into your eicrs to assist your observations and recommendations um, again and i find that very helpful because when you hand over to a client and they can see you know illustrations of your observations illustrations of the things that you're pointing out um, it just gives them that extra information it gives them that extra understanding of the potential problems um, and I found it, you know, I, I do find that they do like it. It, do, it does obviously mean that it takes a while for you to complete compared to a typical EICR. Okay, it does mention it's recommended that persons refer to requirements of electricity at work regulations. And this is obviously pointing out the issue of live parts. So thermal imaging, again, you know, consumer units, load centers, boards, um, we have to take the panels down. We have to take the panels down to actually then take an assessment of the information to actually get access to the points that can overheat. There are a couple of options, which we'll cover in a minute, that might work around that. But fundamentally, for the broader spectrum, we've got to take panels down. This is a live work task. So you've got to identify the regulations and you've got to look at your system of work. So electricity work regulation 14, which covers this. So is it unreasonable all circumstances for it to be dead? Well, we've said we need to have some level of load to start to give us that information. Now, could you, Turn the board off, take it off, and quickly capture an image. Technically, yes, depending on how quick you are, but then that's obviously dangerous to work quickly, you know, to rush that. But as soon as you take loads off, information will start to be lost as conductors start to cool down. So, you know, and if you've got something that's really, 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 really hot, is, you know, can we scientifically calculate how long, how hot that will be after a period of 30 seconds of downtime? You know, this is an area you don't really want to train, you know, step into. So you're going to lose so much information if you do it that way. Yeah, you'll get an understanding that something was wrong, but you you won't know how wrong it was. Uh, my recommendation is to get permission to turn off, turn the panel off, take the panel off with it off, because then you haven't got that risk of an arc flash due to the manipulation of conductors if you take the panel off. I understandably though that's not really practicable in many many circumstances so you need to think about stepping up the ppe for that bit so you might look at a bit of a, an arc flash or a face shield or some kind of category ppe to accommodate the risk because when we take a panel under load off we're changing the environment in the panel and there is a risk of an arc flash which is another area i want to discuss on a future webinar so isn't it unreasonable in circumstances for it to be dead? Most likely, because you're going to lose information. Is it reasonable in circumstances for you to be near it while this is live? I mentioned there are some alternatives. One of the alternatives is these windows that you can get. So you can get thermal imaging windows manufactured and put into panels. And these allow the, the ra radiation to travel through, but not reflections. So they, they actually allow light and radiation to travel through, or you can have just viewing ports. The problem with them, 
is they're most often installed for just specific points of measurement, which means you can go to a buzz bar and check those connections, but you're not going to be able to check the connections of all the other live conductors. Otherwise, your panels are going to look like Swiss cheese. So they're okay in some applications, but they're not practical in many others. So, you know, it's a bit of a line with those. Did mention earlier on about the emissivity and we can install labels or stickers to help raise levels up. So if we use these viewports, we may want to have some stickers placed behind them. And these are made by IRS who are, or these are produced by IRS to, for the purpose of this. So you place them on shiny reflective surfaces and they'll gradually reach a better emitter of radiation. And the point of having the shapes is for you when you're looking through a viewport to easily pick up one against the other. So if we had three buzz bars or four buzz bars, and I wasn't sure which one was which for a very narrow viewport. If I was told on the paperwork that the square was a neutral, the triangle was L1, the circle was L2 respectively, I can now immediately pick up, pick them up through the viewing and the imager. So these have been created with that in mind, all on a, an attempt to try to minimize the need to remove panels under load. Going back to the suitable precautions, necessary for danger. We're gonna talk about competence, we're gonna talk about tools and equipment and things like that. Um, fundamentally you're going to have to have uh, sufficient light and space and signage and barriers because of the live work aspect you may have to have accompaniments uh, around the site um, and you'll have to think about pp now with electrical work you may want to think about class zero zero gloves because you're going to go into panels you may want to think about a face shield but with an arc flash risk you may need to then escalate that to quantify it to a higher category this is something that i want to talk about in a, in a future webinar but the way i currently do it is if i have to remove a panel under load i'll put at least ca um, four calorie ppe on which is an arc suit rated you know i say suit it's just it's just an it's an arc jacket which is actually just like a sweater and trousers um and a shield uh, and a little balaclava you don't forget the balaclava everyone forgets about the balaclava uh once the panel's off i can then stay in my work environment, the panel's off, I'm not manipulating any conductors, I'm not making contact, I can maybe put them on, I can then take the PPE off, and I can then stand and I can carry out my survey with electrical PPE applied. So there are, there are workable solutions, and remember, these should be flexible to the scenario. Um, if you have any quer queries on this, that's, that's absolutely fine on PPE and arc flash, but I didn't want to go into arc flash theory here, because we really, we're over time already. Uh, so, um, so hopefully that's been a good cover on what those settings on your camera are for emissivity, reflected temperature. Um, do some research. Uh, there's some great resources. You know, I mean, Flair, Fluke, they, they have lots of resources. They have some guides on thermography, electrical thermography, building thermography. In the UK, we have a competent structure where we can look at training for specific subjects to introduce. There is level one, level two, level three training. I did mine with ITC. There are other people available. But um, if you look at the way it's controlled or the way it's um, structured, if you wanted to look at the idea of going down that as a route, you want to look up BINDT, British Institute of Non-Destructive Testing, and the UKTA, UK Thermography Association, I think it's called. And they've got all sorts of articles, and they'll give you a bit of an understanding on things like the PCN certification and the qualification structure. Uh, my recommendation, though, is, first of all, if you're thinking about it, get something low-end, something that goes into your phone, play at home. Some guys have already started doing that. Look at, you know, reflection, look at emissivity, play with the theory, download the resource, I can put some more stuff online and then decide how you want to apply this to your work. If you just want to use it as a diagnostic tool for fault finding, perfect. If you wanted to go further on into surveying and actually documenting resistance, uh, documenting measurements and things like that, you do really want to think about going on to a level one and then forwards, you'll find it a very, very fascinating sector. That's my opinion. Um, any further questions, Pop, before we finish? There's just one that actually I would like to uh, uh, get clarity on as well um, right. from, from Emma uh, talking about would a clear path, uh, perspex window not work? Um, we spoke earlier about the fact that glass, you, you had that picture with a guy with his glasses on and you've got yes. no, no reading from his glasses. What about perspex? Because obviously it's a different type of material. Would you be able to do a, a survey through perspex? um my initial response would be no because there's um there's it's again it's about the the opaqueness of the material that the 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 
the infrared radiation just can't travel through. Um, do some, I tell you what, uh, there's a company called Iris, I-R-I-S-S, -S, and there are others, make thermal imaging windows. They yeah. will show you how they manufacture the windows, and they'll show you all the materials that the infrared radiation does not travel through. And that is why their windows are manufactured with specific materials that allows them to travel through. So they'll show you different materials that the infrared radiation doesn't travel through, like glass, and I think Perspex is one of them. Don't quote me on that. I would suggest going to a company like Iris who makes thermal imaging windows. Fluke make them as well. Look at the literature. Look at the little bits of why these are thick, why these are a thing. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll find the information there. Yeah, and just as a footnote um, on the infrared thermometers, um, on Emma's toasty maker, mm -hmm. uh, she had 50 degrees on the insulating tape and yep. 27 degrees on the actual <laughs> toaster body. So right. uh, a 23 degree difference. And that's with a thermal imaging thermometer. That's with a uh, infrared thermometer. Infrared. Right, so with that assumption, Emma, thank you. It looks like the emissivity theory works with those as well. Yeah. Thank you for doing consider, that. Um, yeah. 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 Okay, excellent. All right, guys. Uh, look, um, is that all the questions that have come up Pop, that we've we got through? Pretty here? much. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Pretty much it's... Um, thank you guys for taking part. Thank you for your questions. And thank you, Emma, for everyone else for having a play at home and giving us the feedback. That is really, really Yeah, cool. it was good. Yeah. A, couple, yeah. Guess, yeah. a couple of people sort of famous stuff to it and Emma and it was good. The yeah. idea, the idea really of this was, you know, some people have bought these things and they've, they've got, they've, they've got them. Sometimes they stay in the box or they don't know what to do with them or they have a play, but they don't quite understand. And I just want to, I want to try and encourage them to use them more or to just dip their toe in it because it's a really good technology yeah. and it needs to be in electricians and engineers hands with electrical thermography from my point of view, but we need electricians to want to study the subject better. Uh, but thank you for taking part guys. Uh, we're going to be back later on for one on fire, talk about premature collapse, um, mm. talk about the, uh, the history of the regulation. We're going to, uh, Phil's going to put his, his firefighter hat on for that one. But, um, any further questions on this, just send us an email, send us a message. There's your, there's your hat. I've got it ready. Got it ready. Um, <laughs> and we're going to end this webinar now. Uh, this, again, this, um, the, we'll have one of these uploaded to YouTube. This one or the other one we've done, we'll look at which one's got the better audio quality. Uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube in uh, probably a week or so. And I look for the end meeting button. Which Thank you very much. Take care. Right. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. There we go. See you.